Um, and how has how has your research changed in more recent years? You started off looking at dilution and uh, this uh, figure on the, as you say, the um, kind of what would be modern day Turkey. Um, where have you gone from there? Well, I did a lot of work on the, the Greek novels, on romances, which um, was, was great fun. And these are amazing texts, which I mean, they, they are they are um, primarily schematic in the sense that you've got a girl meets boy, they fall in love, they travel, they have adventures, they get separated, they remain faithful to each other, more or less, you know, <laughs> um, uh, less in, in, in many cases. Um, and But then, then they get back together at the end. So it's a classic romance pattern of sort of, you know, the, um, the, the trials of... Um, love um, through misadventure um, and re reunited in marriage at the end. So Sounds very Odyssean. It's very Odyssean and it's got that same Odyssean tension between, on the one hand, um, a sort of intrinsic conservatism because it, it's modelling um, um, marriage as the sort of the, the, the kind of the motor of human society um, and at the same time this sort of sense of the, um, um, the amazing possibilities for crazy things to happen to you in, yeah. in life in the sense that you know, Odysseus can just as Odysseus can can um, Odysseus crewman can undo the bag of winds and you can go whizzing off in some kind of bizarre direction. So in the romances, there's a possibility that these things could go on forever and there's an endless sort of expansion of narrative. Uh, and when are these being written? Same sort of period, first three centuries, uh, CE, uh, imperial era. Um, and these these texts are, um, I mean, it's amazing that uh, twenty years ago people weren't studying these texts because they are so influential on the European novelistic tradition. I mean, they're where people like Fielding and Richardson got their ideas from. The French translations of the Greek novels in the 16th century really did um, drive um, the production of novels in, um, mo modern novels in Spain and uh, France and England as well. So, so why weren't they being studied? Well, because the 19th century, really. Um, you can always blame the 19th century. That's the, the rule of classic. <laughs> <laughs> blame the 19th century. Blame, you know, um, blame um, pre preferably a German, a German or, figure from yeah, the 19th right. century, yes. Um, uh, or, you know, there are, there are plenty of English baddies as well. As well. <laughs> but um, but there was one, one guy in particular, a guy called Evan Roder, who was a friend of Nietzsche's, who, um, uh, I mean, really created a picture of the imperial era that was um, a Greek literary production in the imperial era that was so sort of hostile and forbidding and um, so sort of um, conservative and nationalist, really, because, I mean, he, what, what he, he thought was that this was an era devoted to um, trying to recoup and rebuild um, the classical, um, uh, the, the, the kind of the giants of the classical era. So it, it was, um, I mean, it was in many ways, an, an image rather close to the one that I was peddling earlier, the, the idea of, of, of a culture that was devoted to replicating mm -hmm. um, uh, glories of the past. But in Rhoda's eyes, which is you know, a very romantic way of doing things, it never could. I mean, it's always failed attempts to uh, replicate the past because, um, because you know, the original, in the romantic world set, the original is always the best and anything that's derivative, mimetic and so forth is um, necessarily sort of uh, a, a weak, you know... Um, a myth. pale imitation. pale imitation, yes, that's right. Um, and so you're also saying it's a kind of a nationalist vision, what do you mean by that? Oh, okay, yes, so um, uh, this process of uh, trying to recoup past glories um, was, in Rhoda's eyes, a um, nationalistic exercise. It was an attempt to try to, to protect Greek identity from threats, um, and the threats were coming from two sides, one from Rome and the other from the East. Right. Sort of, um, Rhoda always uses the word monstrous of the East. Um, I mean, it's an incredible uh, um, repetition of this single German word, Ungeheuer, um, time and time again used of the peoples of the East. And he doesn't really define who, who they are, but there's this sort of sense of a huge oppressive threat coming from the East. Um, which a threat is, to the glory of Greece. Threat to the glory yeah. of Greece. Um, uh, so, yeah, so, I mean, he sees um, I imperial culture and in particular, he, he invented this phrase, the second sophistic, which we now bandy around with the abandon. To mean these, to, 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 to refer to the century centuries. culture of yeah. the first three yeah. centuries of, of our era, um, which, um, according to Rhoda, were preoccupied with the sort of the attempt to, to replicate um, the, the, uh, the glories of the past. Um, so yes, I mean, Rhoda saw that as an attempt to try and revivify some sort of primal Greece. And, you know, that very easily decodes itself into a sort of late 19th century obsession with, you know, trying to build national traditions and trying to immure yourself yeah. against sort of 
um, you know, the monstrous East, you know, which are obviously would turn so very much to reading um, the, these works and that particular time in general in relation to his own particular time. Yes, and I think you know we we can't escape that as yeah. scholars and interpreters. And in fact, in a sense, that's our duty, isn't it? To I mean, we're not trying to. Um, uh, recapture the experience of original authors, uh, ori original audiences and readers of ancient texts. We can't do that. What we're trying to do is interpret them for a modern world, and that always involves, at some level, um, taking them out of their original context and sort of interpreting them for the modern so world. Th the very same things that may have been considered a threat in the 19th century, things like uh, the issue of uh, someone who's Greek but not Greek, the yeah. idea of multiculturalism. Well, these are very much things that uh, are part of our world and um, if not celebrated, at least we're learning to live with. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I mean, the we too, like um, the Greeks of the imperial era, are trying to reinvent our heritage the whole time. And we in classics are trying to reinvent the 19th century heritage the whole time, I think. Um, and yes, yeah, so the um, the revolution in studies that I've been talking about really is, at one level, a, a flipping on the head of nineteenth-century paranoia about um, about peoples of the East and so forth. I mean, now there's much more. Interesting. My, my the work that I'm moving into now is much more about, um, uh, if you like, celebrating mm -hmm. um, the miscegenation of cultures. Uh, in the imperial and Hellenistic uh, periods, what Rhoda saw, as you as you said, what Rhoda saw as a threat to the integrity of Greek uh, literary and cultural traditions, you know, we can now see as uh, a much more positive creative energy. And in fact, you know, the the novel seems to emerge out of precisely these sort of tensions between different cultures and different peoples. I mean, it's so it's not just, we shouldn't be seeing the novel as purely Greek or purely Western. Um, well, they're, they're two different things, aren't they? Because, I mean, you know, whether you see the Greek, uh, Greece as a Western... I mean, I don't, don't imagine the Greeks themselves would have seen much to uh, kind of align themselves with... Um, the West. With the West, that's yeah. right, yeah. I mean, they probably uh, saw themselves as more, more Eastern-facing culturally anyway. But, um, but no, we... I, 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 uh, going back to what we were talking about at the beginning, um, there is... The whole post-Hellenistic project is about... The relationship between um, Greek culture, or if you like, Greek language more than culture. I think culture is a slippery word, but the Greek, a sort of um, a Greek, um, Greek, Greek as a, as a, a facilitator of communication between different peoples. Um, there are ways in which elites across the entire Mediterranean and beyond now can communicate with other people in in in, um, in ways that they couldn't before. This is their world wide web. This is their mass literacy, if you like. Right, yeah. um, the Greek language actually creates possibilities for shuttling between cultures. Um, and that's why the novel emerges predominantly in Greek. I mean, it's not exclusively in Greek. There are Aramaic novels, for example, but um, uh, and it, there are bits of the Hebrew Bible that people refer to as novelistic. So I mean, I'm not making a particular claim for, mm -hmm. for, for Greece. But Greek, because it is the language of Alexander's successor kingdoms, and because it's the language of the eastern part of the Roman Empire, covers such a huge geographic span that it actually, as I say, facilitates, glues together different cultures. But without ever fully effacing the identity of the, um, the writer in question. So you get this sense of, of, of the novel emerging. The novel is the only new uh, genre, if genre is the right word, to emerge in the post classical period, really. You know, I mean, the epic and the novel, I suppose. Well, that's right, yeah, well, yes. Yes, the etymology of the word novel yeah. is slightly different. That's from the Italian novella, um, meaning um, news. Uh, um, but, but yes, I mean, um, but it's a, it's a very productive um, word novel. I mean, it, it is. Uh, um, no, novels always think of themselves, I, I think, as kind of creative, fresh, um, emerging out of new contexts um, and non-traditional. There is something intrinsically okay. Go and discuss. You know, <laughs> uh, there is something intrinsically non-traditional about. Novels. And this is how many many people see mm. novels these days. I mean, they are um, uh, always blending different forms of language, different people. So they're very so, much part of this, as you say, this the World Wide Web. Yeah. And yet also they are interested in local concerns and uh, local issues yes. as well. And yes. So it's this kind of combination of the two. Yes, that's right. You get um, themes of travel in novels quite, quite a lot, and that it's the travel theme that allows you to play with these ideas. Um, because going um, going back to the Odyssey, um, 
The Odyssey is a story of a man who um, um, saw many cities and knew the, men, knew the mind of many men. Um, it is a story about um, experience and you know, a, a, a expanding horizons and a sense of a, a bigger world out there and you are changed by these experiences. But of course the, the Odyssey is also about returning home to Ithaca and get, getting sort of back to the world that you know. So again, it's that, you know, that basic structure which is shared with the earliest Greek novels um, incorporates both, if you like, the conservatism of the form, which is always about kind of um, going abroad and then coming back home mm. at some level, and the experimentalism of the, of the form, which is about sort of re really being transformed by experiences of other places. Other That's people. interesting, you both, you both got the, the sense of, the, as you were talking about, the theme itself of... Uh, travel and going into, um, especially if you think of the Odyssey, kind of these fantastical places, and, and that yeah. kind of thing happens in the novel too. But then going home, so you've got the, the the theme of that, but that's also connected to the very form itself, which is both rooted in a tradition and yet also there's a certain rootlessness. With yeah, it as well, yeah, with it, yeah. trying to find its place within this tradition because it's coming after. Yeah, I think because it's now part of this new oikumene. And I think th I think more than that actually. If you look at them, um, we're very lucky to have quite a lot of fragments of Greek novels, papyrus fragments, and what they show us is that these texts are circulating across the empire themselves. So, you know, if you like, the book trade has actually taken them around right. the empire as well. So they are um, a... Uh, the, the novel is a genre that is designed to travel in the way that... If you think of um, Greek tragedy, for example, I mean, of course, at, at one level, we know that Greek tragedies were performed outside Athens yeah. and so forth, but... But the basic sort of uh, mise en scène of the the uh, of a tragedy or comedy, more 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 noticeably, uh, is that particular performance context. Um, Pindar, um, okay, yes, of course they're designed to to be um, to spread the fame of the individual patron, but they always imagine a particular performance context, no matter how fictionally yeah. that, that, that yeah. they, they do that. Um, the novel is nothing like that. The novel doesn't isn't rooted. You know, it is designed to travel. Um, it trades on its ability to. It does. Yes. 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 Actually. Yes. Quite. And that, that that really reflects its new, as you say, the the fact that it's written. Yes. So the, it's now you've got this kind of circulation of books. Yes. Exactly. So yes. It becomes yeah. another commodity. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it, interestingly, the novels are full of traders. Um, you know these figures who, uh, who's you know sort of mercantile figures who go around sort of buying and selling people or goods and, and, and so forth. And that seems to be at some level a metaphor for, um, what these. Uh, novels are actually trying to do, you know, they are, they are um, about um, sharing the currency, the cultural currency. Tim, this has been a, a really interesting, fascinating uh, survey of what you've been up to and really um, shedding some new light on those darker corners, darker recesses of the, of the ancient world, um, corners that um, I profess I don't know much, I don't know too much about. So I'm really grateful that uh, you've taken some time to uh, share your thoughts with us. You're very welcome, Elton. Thanks. Thanks, Tim.